Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. Stephen Hansen, Associate Editor. On this week's pod, a landmark approval in immuno-oncology. And we dust off the toolbox for alternative financings. The sponsor for this episode of BioCentury this week is JATO Capital. JATO Capital is a global leading investment company with a patient benefit-driven approach that finances and accelerates the development and growth of groundbreaking medical innovation. JATO supports entrepreneurs through its expert, integrated, multi-talented team and through significant capital. For more information, please visit www.jato.life or follow the firm on Twitter at jato underscore life or via LinkedIn. And jato is J-E-I-T-O. On Friday, FDA approved Bristol-Myers LAG3 inhibitor, Opduolag. Lauren, you spent quite a bit of time digging into this. Why is the approval such a big deal? Well, this is the first new checkpoint inhibitor against a new target since the first PD-1, PD-L1 approvals, which were about eight years ago now. And after those approvals, there was so much excitement around checkpoint targets and a lot of new ones popped up and a lot of people thought that this worked for PD-1. This is going to work for all of these other new T-cell checkpoints. Years went by. There were a lot of setbacks. And the industry finally has one that, that seems to work well in this indication. And it's a big moment for the field. You know, Lauren, I think we should acknowledge that BMS has been in some ways out in front, right? You can talk a little bit about what they did before in terms of Optivo and Yervoy. They also were, as I understand, one of the few farmers to sort of pick aside. A lot of farmers were thinking, should we go for an immuno-oncology cell therapy like a CAR-T versus should we go for more checkpoints, sort of the targeted monoclonal antibodies? And if I get it right, then BMS sort of had a, you know, a finger in each pie, as it were. And that seems to have paid off for them. It does. I think they were the First, if not one of the first companies to have both a checkpoint inhibitor and a CAR-T on the market. They were the first company to get to the market with any checkpoint inhibitor with, with your boy. I think they were the first globally to have a PD-1 inhibitor with the Japanese approval of Optivo. So they've really been out in front of the immuno-oncology space, and it will be interesting to see what they come up with next. One other thing I wanted to ask you to dig into, Lauren, is even though BMS has been in front, obviously Merck's Keytruda, Merck's PD-1 inhibitor, has really done this massive land grab, dominated the field. But this one from Bristol is a combo of two monoclonal antibodies. And you think, or BMS thinks, that it can sort of encroach in that market space that Keytruda has, has occupied. Tell us a bit more about that strategy. Yeah, so BMS went with a fixed dose combination for Optuolag, which specifically in melanoma, in this case, in first line melanoma. So the idea is that they haven't seen that much monotherapy activity for relatlimab, which is the lag three antibody component of this fixed dose combination. It's more convenient for patients to have one infusion versus two, but it also means that when you're treating first line melanoma patients, if you want to give them the benefit of having this combination of a PD-1 and a LAG-3, they're going to have to, at least for now, go with Updulag. There's no, there's no choice to combine this with k which is what a lot of patients would be getting in the first-line setting. When I spoke with BMS, they said about a third of first-line melanoma patients are currently getting a PD-1 monotherapy. Another third are getting the combination of Optivo and Uravoy, which is also marketed by BMS. So their goal is to target those monotherapy patients, a lot of whom would be getting Keytruda otherwise. So there's a chance that this could disrupt the market share in this indication. And they said going forward, they're planning to 
only use the fixed dose combination for Abdulag. So that means this is a new therapy that is not on the market as a monotherapy. The same could be true of other indications. The point that I found interesting was what you said around Rolatinab not really showing a lot of monotherapy efficacy, because I know back when Insight's IDO inhibitor failed, that kind of changed, at least in some ways, I heard a lot of people saying, oh, well, you have to show monotherapy efficacy before you can really move forward with any combinations, even though we all know that combinations are the way that IO is trending. Does this muddy the water then, do you think, in terms of whether you can move forward with something that doesn't show monotherapy efficacy? Or is that still the mantra and this just happens to be an outlier? I think the mantra has been changing over the years as we've been speaking with people. When, when the IDO blow up first happened, everyone was saying, don't invest in something that doesn't have monotherapy activity in phase one and phase two. And then sort of over the years, I've kind of gotten the sense from investors and from companies that you kind of have to explore therapeutic mechanisms, even if there is no myotherapy efficacy, if you've got a really good rationale for why this is something that would combine well with the PD-1 inhibitor, because these have just become such an important standard of care. And there are a lot of mechanistic reasons why certain things wouldn't necessarily work that well on their own or, or certainly wouldn't work better than the PD-1 head to head, but would add to the benefit. And I think it's an example of why you don't necessarily need myotherapy activity. Yeah, I think it's interesting from an investor perspective because that just adds to the challenge then if you're investing in a company that's in phase one that has a 5% ORR or 10% ORR in their monotherapy trial. We've seen over time, if I think of like the adenosine path, some of the adenosine pathway targets, those sort of things, a lot of those companies kind of got written off for not having much activity very early on and makes it that much more challenging maybe for an investor then. Yeah, but yeah. I think Stephen also... You know, it's certainly the case that after Optiva and Keytruda were approved, everyone was trying everything against the wall to see what would stick. They were like, oh, let's combine this and that with a combo. Let's not bother with the monotherapy. Let's just do these combos. So it's possible that what Lauren is saying is the field has sort of settled down. I don't know whether investors understand more biology than they used to. I know that's been an ongoing question regarding generalists, at least. But there's certainly this idea that Lauren has been talking about, which is show a mechanistic rationale for why two would work where one didn't. And then maybe you can bring in investors to the table on that. Or maybe investors will sit on the sidelines and, you know, don't know how the markets are going these days. I know you're going to tell us in a minute about a bunch of the tools, but I do want to give you one minute, Stephen, because you mentioned before how excited you are about the clever name. Tell us about <laughs> oh, do you allow wow. the name. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I don't don't overstate my my level of excitement here, but when I saw it, I was like, oh, I get it. It's Optivo and then Dua for two combination with leg. And I just I thought it was nice that they kind of worked all that into the uh, the brand name rather than I think maybe in the past couple of years, we've seen some maybe a little more questionable <laughs> brand names sometimes companies pick. Most, well, my message most... always when people are choosing names is pity the poor editors, pity the poor editors. And pity the... Uh... Many of the news editors who have to try to say it on uh, their editorial calls. I'm still, frankly, trying to recover from a uh, rectogesic from a decade or so ago. But, uh, you know, I'm a sensitive flower. So, all right. Well, Lauren, I'm curious, what is next up in the pipeline behind up do a lag? Oh, that is fun to say, Stephen. So one that's on everyone's radar is the anti tigit map, map from Genentech. I think we'll see data, phase three data this half. That is one where Genentech is testing it in combination with their PDL1 inhibitor to Centric, but they are not testing it as a fixed dose combination. Merck has three next generation checkpoint inhibitors in phase three, and they're testing all of those in co formulations, as they call it a lag three, a Tigit, and a next generation CTLA four. We've looked at the pipeline since 2015 of a set of next generation checkpoint targets, and it's been growing rapidly over the last few years, especially since we've started to see the Tigit data and the lag three data and these encouraging results from a couple of the targets. Even those that have had trouble and have faced setbacks are, for the most part, continuing to see development through the phases and, and more programs added to the pipeline. As I so often do, I want to point everybody to the super cool graphics in Lauren's story. 
where you can click through and experience checkpoints through the years. <laughs> See how that pipeline has uh, grown and grown. Uh, let's turn to IL2. Last week, of course, we saw the failure of a late stage IL2 program from Nectar. It is their big melanoma program that four years ago, Bristol Myers paid nearly $2 billion for to share in the program's rights. The failure once again highlights the challenge of harnessing IL-2 as a cancer immunotherapy. Steve and Lauren, I want to turn to you. Talk us through this a little bit. Well, for me, I mean, one of the things I guess that I took away from this I'll let Lauren maybe speak a little more directly about the different IL-2s that you can go after here and the different ways you can try and kind of get around some issues that they may have seen. But for me, this speaks to what we saw when they did this deal. It was at a time where biotech was very much, very much in vogue. There was a lot of interest in the space. I believe when they did the deal, there was only a handful of, of patients that they had data for, but it was pretty promising at the time. I think it was a fairly high response rate, but as time went on, that response rate kind of kept ticking down, ticking down. And if you track Nectar's stock price, you can kind of see a correlation there between investor confidence in the program as it goes forward. For me, it speaks to a little bit of the over-exuberance that maybe we saw at the time and excitement for what is based on fairly small patient numbers. I think there's still a lot of excitement around IL-2, but there are a lot of new structures of the IL-2 molecule that companies are developing. This is one of the earlier ones, if I have that correct. The whole idea with these next generation IL-2s is that you wanted to design them to avoid binding the IL-2 receptor alpha chain, but to, to bind the rest of the receptor, because that would prevent you from sort of activating the suppressive immune cells and the effector immune cells. So there's a pretty big pipeline of these not alpha IL-2s that our colleague Danielle looked into, and there are some very cool graphics in her story, but she looked into the pipeline beyond that star and grouped them by the different types of structures. So Nectar avoided binding IL-2 receptor alpha by adding PEG groups, and there are a couple other companies that are doing these kind of chemical modifications. There are other companies that have alternative sequences for IL-2 to accomplish the same thing. What I think is kind of interesting are the, the companies that are trying to actually target the IL-2 to the cancer or to a specific tissue so that you're not just developing a broad immune response. You're directing the cytokine to the tumor. Sounds good. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Danielle's story is up on our website, biocentric.com. And we also had our colleague, Paul Bananos, wrote specifically about what's next for Nectar. The company's been around for uh, many years now, and I think they need to start looking at what's next. Speaking of looking at alternatives, the downturn in the markets continues. Last year, we saw billions and billions of dollars in fundraises via follow-on financings. This year, not so much. Stephen, what are companies doing to make it through these tough times? Yeah, so I think the latest number we had in our database was 15 follow-ons so far this year at about one and a half billion, which is well off the pace of, of last year, which admittedly was a record year for follow-ons. But still, it's basically there are no follow-ons getting done, partly for two reasons. One is a lot of companies' unwillingness to finance at what they perceive to be such a low valuation, because we have lots and lots of companies that are near their 52-week lows. But then equally, investors are also obviously getting hammered in this market. And so a lot of their responses is to basically focus on funding their existing portfolio companies. So what bankers were telling me is that one of the challenges is really trying to find new buyers to get into some of these deals. It's kind of on both sides of the equation. And so what companies are doing is turning to either some of these alternative structures, so register direct or pipe, which are kind of two sides of the same coin in terms of placing shares with specific investors, typically investors that are strong owners of your stock already. So people that have already been longtime backers and that are looking to keep backing the company. 
obviously there are some companies are having to turn to unit deals where you're putting in warrants and these sorts of things to try and entice investors to want to buy in the stock because then it gives them an option to buy even more shares at a typically an even lower price. And obviously if the price goes up, they get an even better deal. But there's also obviously a lot of um, a lot of debt deals that we're seeing now as well. And so it's interesting to see how companies are deciding which direction to go. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, among the people you spoke with, I think one comment, which was fairly sobering was, you know, first up, you've got to really batten down the hatches, cut back to your core programs. And we've been talking a lot about the talent crunch in biotech, especially what we're seeing in Boston. But now we may be facing uh, an extended period where we're looking at layoffs, which obviously is a, a word that no one wants to hear. How about royalty deals, Stephen? So in this type of market, the closer you are to having a marketed product, basically the more optionality or, or opportunities you have to do deals. And one of those that seems like there's getting a lot of interest of late are around royalty deals. And these aren't just selling existing royalties, but creating synthetic royalties. One of the benefits, I think, of the financing boom we've had over the last couple of years is that you had a lot of companies that were, rather than partnering off global rights to their programs, they were either retaining full rights or retaining US rights or these sorts of things. So they have value in that. And so what they can do is if you're close to the market, now granted, you basically need to have phase three data to do this, but you can do a synthetic royalty where you can sell a 5% stake, 10% stake, what have you, and get some money up front. And so I think that's that's an interesting route for companies to take just because it's non-dilutive and it doesn't create this huge potential debt albatross kind of around the company's neck that, you know, could come back to hurt them in the future. And so your story also up on our website, Stephen, and you're following up with a data bite today. We've seen 30 public equity deals outside of traditional follow-ons so far this year. And these deals have mostly been small, you found, raising around 10 million, 15 million. Do you expect to see bigger deals, Stephen, or should we continue to expect them to be fairly small? So the size of a deal is a function of the company's market cap. For a standard follow-on, you do about maybe 20% of what your market cap is. And so that's why equity deals are, at this point, really not that appetizing for a lot of companies, because if your market cap is you know, $140 million, you can only really want to raise about 28 million. And for a lot of companies, that might not really be enough to get it through. That's where some of these debt deals become interesting. For instance, I noted in the story that a company like Eurogen had a market cap of about 140 million, but they were able to do a $100 million debt financing. And so you can get more capital in through a debt deal. The other thing I thought was quite interesting is that there are quite a few companies that because of their low valuation and what they think is a far too low valuation, they're doing straight secured loans with the idea that they're just looking to bridge themselves over the next year or two with the idea that A, they have milestones that are coming that they're hoping will increase the value of the company, or they're just hoping to make it to a better market, you know, a market that better reflects what they think is their fair value. And so they're getting in these 20, 25, $30 million loan deals with the idea that it's non-dilutive, and it sort of kicks the can down the road until they can get to a point to where they think they can then do an equity deal that better reflects their their valuation. Obviously, that comes with the risk of what happens between now and then for, for the company and its pipeline. I thought it was an interesting trend there we were seeing around what I was terming these bridge financings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you spoke with the executive team of Candle, Paul Peter Tuck, and his CFO, John Canapa. What they said was that they're hoping that this is a bridge that gets them to a position where the company's programs have generated more value and to a market where that value is better appreciated, I think is the way you put it. So this is a great story. If you're out there and you're planning your next financing, definitely give this story a read. Stephen lays out the toolkit that you'll want to consider. Thank you, Stephen, Lauren, Simone. Just like to remind everybody that we do have our new show, The BioCentury Show. Our next episode is Thursday. Our colleague Steve Usden will be speaking with CEPI's Richard Hatchett. 
He was the former acting director of the U.S. Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, a.k.a. BARDA, and Hatchet now has led CEPI through the COVID-19 pandemic, forging partnerships with more than a dozen biopharmas across the globe, raising billions of dollars to expedite vaccine R&D, and they're already planning for the next pandemic. So that should be a really interesting show. Look for it on Thursday at thebiocenturyshow.com. And if you're a fan of our podcast, we also have a podcast version of it uh, that you can find on all of your favorite podcast sites, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcast. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.